I actually chuckled uh, when uh, Samah gave me the topic. I think I speak about aortic stenosis too much to the limits they, she, she put it in her schedule. So, uh, so what am I going to cover today? Uh, this is the scope, uh, how common both, uh, why that's common, and diagnosis and treatment. Atrial fibrillation, as uh, Dr. Rawahi said, is the most common uh, arrhythmia uh, for adults. Aortic stenosis, as well, is the most common uh, valve lesion uh, in adults. Uh, is it a casual uh, co-founder that both are coexist and they are very common in the same time, or is it a disease leading to another? This is what we're going to talk about today. They coexist in 30 to 35 percent of the patients, depends on the study that you're quoting. And this is being displayed in multiple registries all over the world. Uh, they would uh, say that uh, AFib coexists in aortic stenosis between 33 to 40% in some of the studies, uh, which is the partner study and partner A study. They are quite famous studies. Bath physiology of aortic stenosis, I don't want to be dull. Uh, aortic stenosis is uh, the valve will get sclerotic, then uh, fibrotic, then uh, start to build up calcium. Start up with a valve area of 3.5, then 3, and then decrease to below 1. So you would call it severe at that point, and you would measure the gradient, and you would know that. At the same time, patient will develop symptoms. However, symptoms are quite uh, uh, like it's a quite different. Just like uh, what uh, the, the, today we were talking about, some patient will not have symptoms with AFib is the same with aortic stenosis because unfortunately our patient doesn't do much. So they wouldn't come to you till um, their uh, valve area is pretty small and pretty tight. Uh, and uh, we, it's been shown that actually patient variable in tolerating how much aortic stenosis they could. I have a patient whose uh, uh, valve area is 0.6 and this has been well documented, still the patient's completely asymptomatic. We are doing it for critical AS. This is, wasn't, to be honest, uh, something uh, you would uh, encounter in North America. In the same time, uh, while you're having aortic stenosis, we know that you develop a lift atrial enlargement. We know that lift atrial enlargement, uh, uh, the, the, the pressure will increase in the lift atrium over time. We know that it's a, a morphological indicator of chronically uh, increased hemodynamic burden. And we know that by itself, lift atrial enlargement has been reported to be a predictor of death, incident of heart failure, atrial replacement in AFib and stroke. And that made us think about a different way to stage uh, classify, classification of aortic stenosis, different than just by valve area and uh, uh, echo. So there are actually stages of how the heart is going to be damaged by aortic stenosis. At stage zero, I almost haven't seen any in Kuwait so far, a patient who would come with the severe aortic stenosis, but there is no LV damage at all. There is no LVH, there is no lift atrial uh, dilatation, there is nothing except aortic stenosis. That's actually very common in North America, but not here. Uh, usually, usually a patient who is a runner and comes uh, with some shortness breath and they will do an echo for him or somebody uh, like a family physician would auscultate a murmur, send him for echo and they will find uh, aortic stenosis. Stage one is a quite common. You will find some LVH and you will find some uh, LV dysfunction as well. This is, uh, this is pretty common. Uh, I think at least 30% of our patients Stage two is even more com more common as a as a as a as a forty percent of our patients. Patients would have uh, LA dilatation and uh, moderate to severe MR. Now um, LV dysfunction and uh, LV damage already happened, unfortunately. The 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 next stage is uh, stage three pulmonary uh, and tricuspid damage happens, and stage four is RV damage happen. And once that happened, most patients actually will not benefit from any intervention you would palliate. Cardiac damage correlates very nicely with death as well. If you are stage four, your risk of death is 16, 18% even after EVR in one year. Uh, if you're stage uh, zero, your risk of death is 2.3%, which is very similar to a 65 years old without aortic stenosis. So even if you don't have aortic stenosis or you have aortic stenosis post-valve replacement at stage zero, your, your risk of death is actually the same. Uh, for the, the stage one and stage two as well, 
uh, it's increased and uh, the, the higher the stage uh, it's getting increased and they excluded coronary artery disease and COPD and the results is even more um, more amazing class zero your risk of death is zero you, you shouldn't die if you had, don't have COPD or, or coronary disease if you're stage four your risk of death is 24 percent so earlier intervention better for the patient and it's easy the suggestive mechanism is you have a lot of pressure lots of pressure inside the lv lv will work harder lv will get thicker diastolic dysfunction lift the atrial will get enlarged and you develop afib once you develop afib your um, uh, your lv function will even deteriorate more and patient will develop right heart failure and the the the, the same thing so we knew now that there's a very good correlation between our tick stenosis and AFib. So, uh, but I'm also suggesting that it's quite difficult to make a diagnosis of aortic stenosis just because you have AFib. We have regular aortic stenosis, the daily practice of high flow, high gradient aortic stenosis. Everybody now knows that. It's very easy to diagnose in the, in the echo lab. We have low flow, low gradient. We can just do dubitamine stress test and we will get our gradient. We have paratextical low flow, low gradient. When you have normal LV function, but the stroke volume is small because the LV cavity is very small, you know, and you can actually do CT scan and you would know um, if uh, calcium score is high and this is real aortic stenosis or not. But we have another entity which is very difficult to diagnose is normal flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with a normal uh, stroke volume. And many patients actually will go through, like come to you in the clinic and you will label them with a moderate or mild aortic stenosis and then you continue labeling them though, even though they have actually severe aortic stenosis. And why is that? Because most of those patients actually in AFib or severe diastolic dysfunction. And when you are measuring your, um, your, your mean, you will average five beats. Just this is the way that has been suggested to uh, get the... Uh, the severity of the mean, and you are you're excluding the highest uh, among those um, in the mean, and you end up with a with a moderate or mild result, even though this patient could be severe. So, if it could actually make the diagnosis of aortic stenosis more difficult. Second the stage is actually our treatment of AS can cause AFib. So, AFib, AS can cause AFib. AS treatment can cause AFib as well, unfortunately. If you send the patient for surgery for any cause, if you're sending for coronary artery disease, uh, cabbage, mitral replacement, aortic valve replacement, the risk for all those surgeries combined is up to 50% of AFib uh, momentarily after the, ca after the AR or during the AR. And this is could be increased with age, uh, you know, um, if you are clapping the patient for a longer period inside the OR. TAVI is less um, uh, in comparing to, uh, to comparing to, ca uh, to aortic valve replacement surgically. And in a partner trial, it's recorded to be 8.6 versus 16% for uh, SAVR, but still there, it's 8.6. Usually, those patients with a new AFib during uh, valve replacement do better than uh, old AFib. And this has been uh, well reported that patients who have uh, AFib have twofold increased risk of all cause and cardiovascular mortality at one year comparing to patients who with no AFib. Uh, and uh, they, it's correlate very nicely with chad vas score. So the higher that your chad vas for, uh, for uh, patients, the higher the mortality of the patient. Yeah, for uh, if it's combined with aortic stenosis. Funny enough that uh, all patients with aortic stenosis will have very high chad vasc anyway. Uh, if you calculated the BMP, all of them will be a conscious heart failure. Very uh, high chance that once you relieve the aortic stenosis, you will end up with a, with the LB pressure and the systematic pressure will be equal and you will have hypertension. Most of them will be old, older than 65. That's why they're having TAVI. So um, their CHAD score eventually will be very high. What's the risk factor for TAVI causing uh, AFib? Uh, there is uh, clinical conditions and there is procedure condition. From the procedure condition, uh, anybody who's having, uh, you know, non-transfemoral is higher risk, especially if they're having apical. You know, in the older way, they used to do TAVI just through transapical. They will just... Uh, 
perforate the apex and put a valve through it. Uh, fortunately, this is not uh, practice anymore. Uh, and uh, if, do you have any hemodynamic instability during the procedure? Or if you did any ballooning during procedure as well, uh, this is, could be a uh, cause for uh, AFib or risk factor for AFib. Age, uh, NYHA class, uh, low EF, uh, increasing uh, left atrial atrial uh, size, all are good causes and chronic kidney, uh, lung disease as well, all uh, are risk factors for developing AFib after TAVI. To be honest as well, we, we, when, when, when I was in fellowship, I was doing a lot of two, two weeks um, halter just before TAVI, just to see, to check for poses, uh, to see if this patient can require a pacemaker. Uh, before putting uh, uh, the valve, and so we don't blame the valve for the for the pacemaker, we just blame the patient. However, we detected a lot of AFib, uh, even for the patient who is asymptomatic, not labeled as AFib, so we started in the coagulation, then we stopped it two days before the procedure, and we did the procedure. And that brings us um, to uh, the last part is management of AFib or is quite complex as well. You are between rate control and the stroke prevention. The rate control, most of those patients actually have a lot of uh, conduction issues. And uh, you are between, should you give them beta blocker, you should not give them beta blocker, should you give them lifelong amiodarone or not. They have lift bundle to start with. Their conduction system is actually tied by a thread. Should you uh, look at this PR and you start to be anxious, then you start to be doing more proactive and put pacer in those patients just to control the heart rate. So it's quite difficult, and we had uh, our share of discussion, me and Samah, <laughs> for the past uh, two years since we came back. Uh, every case, should we do PACER, should we give uh, more antiridmic for those patients or not? For stroke prevention, is actually more difficult, uh, because uh, as we know that uh, our stenosis tend to have high syndrome, which is injured dysplasia in the, in, the, in the abdomen. They tend to bleed by themselves. And there is a risk also for paravalvular leak. Paravalvular leak can destroy as well uh, RPCs. So um, those patients who are bleeding, 60% will reverse with fixing the valve, but 40% will not. And uh, they will remain to have high syndrome. They will remain to bleed even though we fixed um, the, 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 the aortic stenosis. And that uh, would put us even in more difficult situation. Should now we give uh, single antiplatelet with a NOAC, should we give uh, dual antiplatelet with NOAC, and should we give only NOAC? Nobody knows the answer. Nobody knows what we are doing with the tissue valve, especially with the TAVI valve. Somebody give this, somebody give that. We tailor it to the patient, but we don't know what we are doing, uh, basically. And that's where uh, watch stabber came in. Uh, there is a study uh, being held, yes. <laughs> being held in the U.S. now. At, uh, they finished enrollment in uh, December 2022. Uh, we are about to see the results soon, um, hopefully for follow-up. So they took patients with aortic uh, stenosis in the interior population. They randomized them, Taver and Watchman, or versus the Taver alone. And their issue is they say that stroke actually persists um, for a year after TAVI even though uh, they tried everything to do to, do, to reduce the, 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 the stroke at the time of the TAVI. And there also their theory is that, um, like for example, for rheumatic MS, the thrombus in the left atrial appendage is only 57% of the time, but the thrombus in a left atrial appendage is 100% in patients with aortic stenosis. So if they, you're gonna find the thrombus, it's gonna be in the left atrium for aortic stenosis. We tried our best to prevent stroke in TABI because it's, if we are doing it for a quality of life in el uh, elderly, if, if I'm doing it for a patient who is 80 years old, I'm doing TABI, and I end up giving him a stroke, uh, that's actually a huge catastrophe. Like I, I might have left him alone by himself without, without doing the procedure. We're trying to do a sentinel device. We're trying to do decrease the pre-dilatation and post-dilatation. We try to keep the patient well anticoagulated and do ACT during the procedure. We try to prevent uh, valve thrombosis with giving antiplatelets and NOAC. But we don't know what to do with AFib. So, um, so this study came in with um, uh, standard care versus uh, lift atrial appendage closure, the watchtower, just to uh, finish this part. The procedure is quite simple. We would do the TAVI, we would leave the sheath, EP would come, 
use the Venus sheath for the pacer, replace it for a uh, watchman device, and they would close. Then we would close the arterial and venous at the same time. Patient would remove the room with the two devices instead of one. So, AFib and aortic stenosis, very common. Too common, unfortunately, than what you wish for. It's a high-risk patient. Patients with AFib, even if you replace the valve, have uh, double the risk of death comparing to non-AFib patients. Difficult to diagnose sometimes, unfortunately, and difficult to treat, uh, both for heart rate and anticoagulation. Thank you.